Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by Dr. Ronald Brown. Our topic for today is one of the most exciting places in New York City, if not the world, and that is Coney Island. You can see over 50 rides and attractions in one giant pool. Below that, you see Rick Burns' famous TV, American Experience video movie on the history of Coney Island. So it is an exciting place, which we are going to be exploring today in this video. So let's get started. On the left, we see the outline. As usual, this is what we're going to be doing. Number one, early Coney Island. Where'd the name come from? Why was it important and uh, its early history as an actual island, not attached to the mainland? Then the rise of Coney Island as a place for new immigrants to go. Then Coney Island for the masses, the golden age of Coney Island, when literally millions of people would descend upon Coney Island, and especially the great 4th of July celebrations. What Coney Island represented to New Yorkers, it was an escape from the tenements and the slums and the factories of New York City. The decline of Coney Island condemned by rabbis and preachers and priests and bishops as Sodom on the sea. As it declined, it did what it could to keep attracting people and attracted some rather strange people. And then finally, Coney Island and the arts, the memory of Coney Island. It still exists. It's still there. It's still exciting. But it has also attracted a lot of attention by artists who really view it as more than just an amusement park, but a part of American culture and civilization. So let's get started on our visit to Coney Island. Coney Island. Well, how did it begin? Actually, it was a little Dutch island, bottom of Manhattan, the bottom of Queens and Brooklyn, sort of an out of the way place of no major importance. Well, the Dutch called it Konya Island, which meant that it was quite a different um, place than you would expect. Well, island, we can see where we get the name island. Konya is the Dutch name for rabbits. Coney Island was an island. It was covered with grass and little bushes because it was exposed to the sea. But it was a paradise for rabbits. So young Dutch kids from the towns of Brooklyn or Manhattan or even Staten Island would get in a boat or go across land and go to Coney Island and kids could shoot and trap rabbits and earn some extra money. The rabbit meat, I remember growing up eating rabbit meat at home, it was cheap, and we raised our own rabbits. And so when you have eight kids in the family, you don't go to the grocery store and buy steak. You have chickens and rabbits and sheep and cows um, that are your source of meat. Plus rabbits were good because when you take the rabbit fur and you would preserve it, you could make gloves, you could make hats, you could even make coats if you stitch them together. So that's where the name comes from. It was Rabbit Island. And on the map on the left, you see that at the bottom of what is today Brooklyn, at the bottom of the picture, that yellowish part, see that little thing sticking out at the very bottom? Well, on the map on the left, it is part of Brooklyn. But on the left or map on the right, you can see that there are still waterways 
basically cutting off about half of uh, Coney Island from the mainland or from Brooklyn. Um, but at one time, the water went the whole way through and it was a real island. <clears throat> Well, for the Dutch, it was rabbit town. But as New York began to grow, the population increased. More and more of the wealthy people of Fifth Avenue, those families who had made a fortune during the golden age of the Civil War. Wars are good for business. Millionaires were created in New York. Well, they lived on Fifth Avenue or in another part of the growing city of Manhattan. But during the hot summer days, they would send their families to the big, beautiful hotels, which were starting to arise on Coney Island. 1877, 10, 15 years after the end of the Civil War, there were enough millionaires in New York to keep the Manhattan Beach Hotel alive. Wealthy families would send, sometimes the wife and kids for the best part of the hot, humid summer to Coney Island. They would take a steamboat like you see on the right and go from Manhattan around the New York Harbor and to Coney Island where they'd land at the pier out into the ocean and the wife and kids would spend the big part of the summer having fun on the beach, having fun in the hotels, whining and dining and going for rides along the boardwalk. Well, in New York in 1877, there was no air conditioning. You look at the hotel, you'll see that they have these big orange awnings to protect you from the sun so you could sit out on the deck. At night, the breeze would come in from the ocean and cool the rooms. So this was the beginning of Coney Island as a resort for the wealthy. The Hotel Chelsea in Atlantic City was just one of the many other great seaside hotels that sprang up after the um, Civil War. The Hotel de Coronado in California, off the coast of San Diego. Well, here again, it was to allow people to escape from the wild heat and humidity of the city. The robber barons of Fifth Avenue, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, the Pierpont Morgans, the Astors, the Stuyvesants, these were the robber barons of Fifth Avenue. Well, no matter how elegant their mansions along the Fifth Avenue were and how beautiful their churches and clubs and hotels, still they wanted to flaunt their wealth in another place. And so Coney Island became what is today the Hamptons of New York City. The Hamptons came later because you had to have a railroad car and it was far from the city, whereas you could take a nice steamboat, wine and dine on the steamboat, have drinks, and you in no time, you would be at Coney Island. The elite hotels, of course, they began with the Manhattan Beach Hotel, the Oriental Hotel, also of 1877. The Brighton Beach Hotel of 1878. Here again, you see these big old wooden hotels. Well, they were built of wood. And of course, there were gonna be constant fires. Well, so if there's a fire and a hotel burns down, if it is made of wood, it is very quickly rebuilt and it is bigger and more elegant and more expensive than it was last year. Who wants to go to the same hotel every year? You want something different. From 1884, you had the famous Elephant Hotel, very exclusive, only 34 rooms, but 
It was a sight to see. I mean, look at the picture of it towering over the chairs and the doorways and the windows. At a dining room, it was very, very elegant. And here again, catering to the whims of the crazy, wealthy people. To get there, you took a steamboat. And you can see the picture in the upper left. You see the piers out into the Atlantic Ocean. And boats would land. People would promenade down the deck, be picked up and taken to their hotel. And this was really a um, part of the upper class New York society. And here you see the uh, um, advertisement, the Iron Steamboat Company, uh, who were steamboats. They were no longer sailing boats, so they could even go in uh, poor weather or in weather when there was no wind. Look at the picture at the bottom on the right. You see people, men in suits and top hats, women in dresses down to the floor, covering their faces with a veil so as not to be burned by the sun. It was a wonderful time for the wealthy, where everybody knew everybody else. Families would present their beautiful daughters or their handsome sons just back from Harvard or Yale or Princeton. Marriages were made, marriages were celebrated. People invited other people, a new wealthy person such as Andrew Carnegie, multimillionaire from Pittsburgh. That's where he would be presented to the elite during the summer season. <clears throat> Well, gradually, the island was filled in, and the island ceased to be an island, and it became just a part of the Brooklyn. Well, this was very common, beginning already in the 1800s, where people would just dump their garbage in the land and uh, gradually build a walkway or maybe a highway or a road, or later on a train link, so that gradually the water between Coney Island and the rest of Brooklyn was filled in. Well, this was very common. If you look at the map on the right, you see how Beginning in the 1650s, New Yorkers from Manhattan threw their garbage into the East River or into the Hudson River and dumped dirt, built more land and built buildings on the land. So you can see by 1980, Lower Manhattan was almost twice as wide as it had been under the Dutch very dark colored area with that little four pointed fort at the very bottom. That was Dutch New Amsterdam. And today the fort, which at one time was right on the uh, harbor, is now well inland. It's a custom house in lower Manhattan. So gradually the islands were filled in. The water between the island and the mainland was filled in. Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, even Staten Island started growing to accommodate the growing population. Well, following the Civil War, there were not only millionaires who were filling New York City and especially the growing street of Fifth Avenue, but hundreds of thousands of new immigrants flowed into the city. The Civil War turned New York City in into an industrial powerhouse. Pittsburgh and Chicago and Detroit and these cities of Cleveland further west were only beginning to grow as cities. Industry, shipbuilding in Brooklyn, steel mills along the East River, manufacturing of shoes, of clothing, of furniture, New York was an industrial city. Money from the Civil War, and especially money from the California gold mines, flowed into the city. And wealthy people, of course, wanted to become even wealthier. 
So to provide labor for all of these new factories, the United States basically just threw the doors open of immigration and anybody who wanted to could come to the United States. Beginning in the 1880s, this was the low, high point of Southern Italian immigration. Huge Little Italy's were built. Eastern European Jews settled in the Lower East Side. Eastern European Catholics from Hungary, from Poland, from Czechoslovakia, from Slovenia, flowed into the city. Large numbers of Greeks, Armenians, settled in the city. So New York became a city of immigrants. Well, of course, like all immigrants, you go to where real estate is cheap. The Bowery, the Lower East Side, many Little Italy's, Hell's Kitchen. These became filled with slums and tenements. When you are a new immigrant, you don't speak English, you don't have a job that is useful in New York City, you basically do what you have to to survive. You have to hustle. Women and young girls would work in textile factories. The men would go into construction. They did what they could to survive. And if you had problems surviving, well, if you were a woman and had a decent body, you could become a prostitute in the evenings. Men could become thieves and robbers, even murderers. So the slums and the tenements of New York City were dangerous places. They don't call it Hell's Kitchen along the Hudson River for nothing. It was hot. Wagons would go around every morning picking up the dead bodies, those who had died of disease, those who had been murdered, those who were simply homeless people and freezing to death in the street. So New York became a very congested city filled with workers, immigrants from Eastern Europe and Southern Italy. This history of New York is well preserved. The Lower East Side Tenement Museum shows how the people lived in their apartments, in their slums at that time. Jacob Reese photographed the lives of these new immigrants, abandoned children, runaway children. Top on the right, we see a family that turns its apartment into a textile factory during the day, sewing shirts and sewing on buttons and sewing pants, which they were paid a certain sum of money for each shirt, which they sewed together. Many young women and young men worked in the giant textile factories, such as the shirt waste factory famous for its fire. And of course, when you live in a slum, in a tenement, and 10 people in a room, you spend your day in the street. These were the street markets where you could buy everything and anything. Of course, half of the food was bad. The milk was diluted with water. The meat might be wormy and old. The bread would be stale. But at least you could get the food, you could cook it well, and you could survive. So the lives of the people in the slums was not a wonderful place. But yet, they were coming to New York. The factories were here. The jobs were here. This was a place where they could reinvent themselves, fleeing poverty, fleeing ethnic religious persecution in Eastern Europe, fleeing the hard, rocky poverty of Southern Italy. America was the golden door. It gave them a chance to reinvent themselves. Well, gradually these workers, especially the younger kids, would get a job. They could save their pennies. And they wanted to get out of the slums, especially on a hot summer day. 
where it was a hundred degrees and terrible humidity. So Coney Island began to attract a lot of these people. The boardwalk was there, the beach was there. Of course, they couldn't go to the expensive hotels and have a lovely sit down dinner in a suit and a tie and a woman in a beautiful hat, but at least they could get out of the slums. By 1890, the famous Coney Island and Brooklyn Railroad was operating. Look at the map at the bottom. That is Brooklyn. And you see the train running through the middle of Brooklyn. Very few houses were there. It was still largely sand dunes and vacant. So it was a real experience for these young people to get on the train, sometimes an entire family, buy a ticket for five cents, go the whole way out to Brooklyn. Even if you didn't have any money, the boardwalk was there. The beach was there. You could take a sandwich and a couple bottles of beer and you could have a wonderful day. So this is how <coughs> The working classes, the masses of New York managed to escape from the congested slums and tenements of the city. By 1904, the first subway line was open. See, it was an elevated train because the steam engine burned coal. So you had the L well before 1904, but with the invention of electricity and the popularization of electricity, the train could suddenly go underground. And on the right, you see the map of the very first line opened in 1904, going the whole length of Manhattan from City Hall at the bottom, the whole way up to 145th Street with gradual extensions going north and south and east and west, and eventually the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge and the extension of the subway across the bridge and into Brooklyn. So gradually a kid living in the Lower East Side or along Canal Street or uh, even Upper Manhattan could jump on the subway, go down the city hall, switch trains and go to Brooklyn and go the whole way across to Coney Island. By 1915, for five cents, you could jump on the subway in Manhattan, go across the bridge into Brooklyn and continue on to Coney Island. On the left, you see the City Hall subway station. Still looks the same today. But look at the people on the right, these women dressed to the hilt, men in suits. It was still a very upper class society, but you could escape and you could go out to Coney Island. So Coney Island was transformed from a island filled with big luxury hotels for the wealthy and it started becoming a resort area for the masses. On the top, you see the old Coney Island with the big, beautiful luxury hotels. Well, look at it on the right, where on a 4th of July, the estimate was 1 million people filling the boardwalk and the beaches of Coney Island. The piers are still there, sticking out into the ocean, but people were now taking the train and going out to Coney Island. The big hotels gradually burned down or were demolished and replaced by fast food places, cheap entertainment for the masses. Well, the year late, 1890s marked the golden age of electricity. Now, this was important because you could do nightlife. 
Before you had electricity, you had oil lamps. And Coney Island, actually, like most of New York, after sunset, people stayed home unless they had a carriage and a carriage driver with a gun to protect the people. People didn't go out. There was no such thing as nightlife. There was no such thing as window shopping. There were no restaurants open into the late, uh, late hours of the night. But with the arrival of Thomas Edison's light bulb and electric generating plants, people could plug into electricity. And Coney Island celebrated electricity, just like Broadway, which was renamed the Great White Way because of its abundance of electric lights. And so you see postcards from Coney Island featuring the moon and electric lights everywhere. So you could go out to Coney Island, enjoy the beach during the day in the boardwalk, nap under the boardwalk, and then get up and enjoy the nightlife. And people would very often stay all night and leave the next morning. So it became, Coney Island became a place not just for beach and luxury hotels, but for the masses, nonstop, 24 hour a day on the weekends, entertainment. Celebrating electricity was what it was all about. The Great White Way, giant advertisements on the streets. Even churches and synagogues would outline their altars or their bimas with brightly colored lights. We recently visited the Eldridge Street Synagogue, and there the whole bima, the whole front, is outlined in big colored lights. Looks sort of crazy, like a circus, but that was the style of the time. Window shopping, nightlife became possible with the newly invented electricity. Here we see the Eldridge Street Synagogue, electric lights everywhere. It was built in 1887, and so electricity was already a possibility. Look at the front where you see the circle of lights um, circling the bima or the front altar area. It was a celebration of electricity. Well, if you were not going to go to an expensive restaurant, you didn't have the money for it, and more and more of them were closing, well, you could always bring a sandwich. But Coney Island is famous for inventing fast food, where you didn't have to sit down, have a waiter wait on you, buy an expensive drink. You picked it up at a stand, like the hot dogs here, and you ate it while you walked. So Coney Island was more than just an escape from the city, but it was a whole new way of life. Well, escaping from the reality of the slums, the sweatshops, the crime, the disease, the heat, and the humidity, is what these young workers wanted. Young kids would escape from their families, Italian Catholics or Orthodox Jewish kids would sneak off and tell their parents they were going someplace and they ended up enjoying Coney Island. Well, the emphasis was on escaping from your terrible daily life. Here we see Dreamland, 1904 to 1911, where you could go in and you'd see these dramatic reenactments of the Garden of Eden, the creation of humanity, where God literally descended and created Adam and Eve. 
You escape from reality into a world of dreams. Hellgate, you could even visit hell and see devils and demons in real life. Of course, there were the rides, which were thrilling, the roller coasters, the Ferris wheels. On the right, you see a Chinese temple. I mean, of course, these young kids couldn't go to China, but in Coney Island, they could not only visit the creation, God created the world, they could visit hell, but they could actually visit China. <clears throat> ballrooms where you could dance. And there they didn't say, well, I'm an Italian a Catholic immigrant or I'm a Jewish Orthodox uh, person from Russia. If you were a decently dressed young guy and you saw a decently dressed young woman, you asked her to dance. I mean, and this caused a lot of consternation among good families. Orthodox Jewish girls should not be dancing with Italian Catholics, and especially the waltz or the polka, where you actually took the person into your arms. The ballrooms, the canals of Venice. Well, of course, like China, you could never go to Venice or Italy, but you could experience it on a gondola going through a recreation of Venice. Now, all of these entertainments, of course, were made of wood. They were not steel and concrete. And of course, every year there would be a fire where something would be destroyed. Well, it was rebuilt very fast. And it was, again, bigger and better than it was last year. Who wants to go to the same entertainment every year? You wanted something new. So the destruction and fires and hurricanes were built into Coney Island. Anything was possible. Lilliputia, 1904, was an entire town of small people, midgets, dwarfs, whatever they call them these days. The owner, you can see in the middle there in the picture, would go around the world from Africa to Asia to Brazil to Mexico to wherever he could find a family that had a small child, pay the parents well, and take the small person, and that person would live the rest of his or her life in Lilliputia. You can see from the picture on the right, it was a real town, its own fire department, its police, its own schools, and they lived there all year long. They had their little carriages where they would go on rides and attract visitors. And it was just a world of curiosity. One famous episode was the electrocution of Topsy the Elephant in 1903. Thomas Edison was called in to arrange the electric generator. Well, it ended up, uh, the story was, there was some guy who decided to be cute and gave the Topsy Elephant a lit cigarette to eat. Well, it burned its trunk and the elephant got mad and it attacked the guys and killed three of them. So it was decided that Topsy should be executed. Well, of course, how many of you have ever seen an elephant being executed? So they sold tickets. Thousands of people came to see the execution of Topsy the Elephant. Everything was exciting. Everything was exotic, even erotic. The Tunnel of Love. Once again, see the postcard, the moon, electric lights everywhere. 
Well, you got in a gondola and you went in through the tunnel of love with your girlfriend or the girl that you had just picked up. Well, of course, as soon as it gets dark in the tunnel of love, kissing and hand-holding and who knows what else was taking place in the tunnel of love again condemned by the priests and the rabbis and the ministers, leading people into sin. Well, Coney Island still has the tunnel of love beer, which again celebrates the tunnel of love, which is no longer there, but was part of the history. Atlantis, the famous sunken city somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, well, it became a reality. You got on a boat, you went in, and you actually visited the famous lost city of Atlantis. Now, these are two postcards. I collect old postcards. I go to junk sales and yard sales, and very often you'll see a big box of old postcards. Well, I'll just buy the whole box for $10, and you come across some really fascinating old postcards. The Wonder Wheel, 1918. Here again on the left, you see the original Wonder Wheel. That's me, one of my recent visits to Coney Island with the Wonder Wheel behind me. Well, Wonder Wheels are part of history. We have Ferris Wheel, the very first one in Chicago in 1893. So the Wonder Wheel of 1918, 1920 was not that big, but you got a magnificent view of Brooklyn, across to New Jersey, out into the ocean and Manhattan. I believe today the largest wheel is the Beijing Great Wheel of 2008, unless that one has been replaced by one which is even larger. <clears throat> The boardwalk as we know it dates from 1923. It is wood constantly being demolished by hurricanes and whatnot. But here we see in these pictures in the 1920s and earlier, people were still dressed to the hill. Look at the men with their hats and their suits, the women with dresses down to their ankles and, and um, um, hats on. On the right, you see one of the, um, um, the Ferris wheel in the distance, and you see the men swimming. Back in the 1920s, it was still not acceptable for men to go swimming topless. You would be arrested. Women did not wear bikinis. They wore a bathing suit, which covered them, and a short skirt very often going down to their knees. And so it was still a very conservative place as late as the 1920s. Fast food. Well, that famous Coney Island hot dogs. See Feldman's, uh, the restaurant shortly again following the Civil War where it started becoming popular to have fast food. And the famous Feltman hot dogs are still part of the Coney Island experience, along with the more popular Nathan's dating from 1916. And here again, you see Nathan's hot dogs. Once again, the original price was five cents. Every once in a while, they'll have a publicity campaign and they'll hand out these little cards, which you see on the right, where you, if you get one of these cards as a gift, you can take it to Nathan's and for a and mere five cents, you can get an authentic hot dog. 
But five cents is really what Coney Island was about for the masses. Even a worker in a factory could hustle together five pennies, take the train, another five pennies, get a hot dog or some fast food, not sit down restaurant. In fact, I went to Nathan's last summer with a friend of mine who was visiting from Mexico, and I found that they had frog's legs. <clears throat> and so the uh, first time at Coney Island, I had authentic Nathan's frog legs. So it is still a major attraction on um, Coney Island, emphasizing the fast food, emphasizing the um, middle class and lower middle class lifestyle, not sitting down in an elegant restaurant with an expensive bottle of wine and white cloth napkins. Here you stand up, you eat it, or you take it with you. The parachute jump, the tower is still there, although it's no longer operating, dates from 1939, where you would get into a halter and you'd have the um, uh, parachute above you. You would be taken up to the top and then you would be dropped. And you had the experience of floating through the sky. Well, look at the picture on the right. Still see the old pier going out into the ocean. Doesn't accommodate steamships anymore, although I think they should restore that. That would be a nice tourist experience to get on the steamboat and Manhattan or Brooklyn someplace or Queens and go out to Coney Island by sea. Wonderful experience. But look at the boardwalk is there. You see all the people on the beach. Luna Park. Here again, we see how each entertainment area would be built of wood, plaster, and a storm would come or there would be a fire and it would be destroyed. Luna Park on the left shows again the moon and electric lights everywhere celebrating new electricity. Well, that one was destroyed. The one on the right at the top was the new Luna Park, keeping those little towers, keeping the moon uh, design, but a more modern one. Well, then that one was destroyed. And there below it at the bottom, you see me and in the distance, you see the intercurrent Luna Park. So many of these entertainment areas went through several um, successive incarnations. The Cyclone, 1927, like the Wonder Wheel, every entertainment area wanted the biggest, the fastest, the most dangerous, the longest, the tallest. Everything had to end with an E. S T. Well, on the left, you see the old cyclone uh, made of wood and then later replaced with iron. Again, if you look at the bottom left, you still see five cents. Well, if I'm correct, I believe that the largest roller coaster is the Six Flags Great America, the American Eagle, which I believe is either the longest, the tallest, or the fastest, or the greatest, or somethingest. Um, although I'm sure the Chinese or the people in Dubai or someplace else are making one which would be longer or taller or faster. But still, this was one of the thrills of Coney Island. Again, five cents. Loop the Loop 1901, an absolute thrill where you're literally hanging from the top of the loop. At the bottom on the right, you can see a reconstruction of the loop. I mean, many of these rides, which no longer exist, um, have been created in miniature and many of them are actually in the 
uh, newly organized Coney Island Museum. And here you see the postcard of Loop the Loop. But if you look closely, you'll see um, it was written by a German tourist or possibly a German immigrant, where it is ends up Zeine Brüder Rudolf, meaning it was Rudolf who sent this postcard to his brother, whether his brother was living in the United States or whether his brother was living in Germany, but it was um, Coney Island had already become an international sensation. Steeplechase Park, where you would get on a wooden horse pulled up to the top and you would go barreling down the other side. Back at the museum, I saw one of the original steeplechase horses uh, that was in the museum. Once again, this caused a lot of controversy because if you look at the third person from the left, uh, you'll see that there is a guy with a girl in front of him on the same horse. And we don't know, were they married? And look at the way they're dressed. I mean, suits and hats. And the woman has a long dress down to the ankle, sleeves down to her wrists and a big white hat. But this was the type of uh, things that the priests and the rabbis and even politicians condemned, but yet they couldn't stop it. Well, great fires were part of Coney Island history. The Great Fire of 1932, $5 million blaze swept floor, four blocks on Broadway. And of course, everybody dashed out to see the fire because that was another exciting event taking place on Coney Island. And of course, it was rebuilt bigger and better. Well, gradually, Coney Island started getting a negative reputation. Even artists would paint scenes of what was going on. And as the time moved on, men started going topless, women started going with bikinis. Late at night, who knows what was happening under the boardwalk, couples on the beach, and it began to decline. It got a very negative reputation. Here we see two paintings, one by Reginald Marsh, showing the wild side of Coney Island. Edward Lanning, showing some of the wild things that were going on, where couples were doing things that a lot of people opposed. Um, Reginald Marsh is one of the great painters of Coney Island, and we see um, some of the wild things going on in Coney Island couples, uh, and you see that it was immigrants, as by 1938, the Puerto Ricans were coming to New York, uh, um, the gates of immigration were closed, but nobody asked who you were. It was a young people's place to have fun. Well, a lot of religious leaders were very alarmed at the, what they considered the decline of Coney Island, where men were going topless, women were making their bathing suits smaller and smaller every year. And so it, Coney Island became a popular place for preachers. And we see on the left of Brooklyn City Mission, people going out and preaching. Um, below that, you see the Salvation Army going out and singing hymns to try to save people. Famous book 
um, went to Coney Island on a mission from God. Be back by five. Coney Island became famous for its street preachers. Um, avoid sin. Um, Coney Island was becoming gradually Sodom, as in Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. It was becoming the sin place of New York City. Well, Coney Island uh, sort of reinvented itself as a place for some really crazy entertainment. Remember, these were young kids coming in from Brooklyn and from Manhattan and Queens. They wanted excitement. So you started having freak shows. For example, at the top on the left, you'd see a person who was half man and half woman. There were people, Penguin Girl, who her skin was covered with a type of scales that made her look like a bird. Half man, a man who was born with nothing below the waist. Pain proof, a woman who had no sensation of pain could put needles through her skin. The bottom on the left, see you know, twins, where the one girl had absorbed her sister. So her sister was inside her and only her sister's legs remained outside the other sister. The bottom on the right, I love that picture, two nuns who sort of wonder what are they doing there? Circus side show, strange deformed babies, swamp man, oh, all kinds of exciting, really um, sometimes disturbing um, exhibits. But Coney Island was a place to escape from reality, to have a thrilling experience. In fact, one of the most exciting things was the infant incubators where people would go and they would see premature babies, some of them so tiny, you wonder how they could be alive. And they would be exhibited as not only a marvel of science, but to show these early um, babies. There's even a book, Miracle at Coney Island by Claire Prentice. Here again, this was a thrill. This was exciting. The two-headed girl. Once again, see four legs where the two girls were linked together, what we call Siamese twins. Sort of wonder where they found these girls. And they're clearly dark-skinned, may have been found in the Caribbean islands or from Africa itself. But these were the kinds of thrills that Coney Island um, featured. Well, as Coney Island continued its decline and inventing all kinds of new strange things to attract people, it also became popular as a place for prostitution, both male prostitutes and female prostitutes where they would have one pavilion which would be devoted to Asian girls. Another one would be devoted to oversized women, big fat uh, women. Others would be tall mi or midgets. You had um, hotels which featured men prostitutes so that women could have a man or another man could have a man. In fact, the famous Elephant Hotel became one of the most famous houses of prostitution at Coney Island. The Coney Island by the 1930s and 40s and even into the 50s became noted for its sexual perversions, its crazy, wild entertainments. Tattoo parlors were famous. 
the silver's baths, the saunas, where you could not only get a salt water bath, a fresh water bath, you could get a massage, but it was a complete body massage. Every part of your body was very carefully massaged. George Tooker's painting of 1947 shows some of the wild things going on. Men are topless. And what was interesting with George Tooker by 1947, African Americans started going to Coney Island. In its earlier years, it was segregated. No Black people allowed, except for those involved in some of the entertainments. But here you see by 1947 that it had been integrated. <clears throat> Nothing could be too exciting, too exotic, too weird. You had one guy, a presario, you see in the top in the middle, who had gone to the Philippines and bought an entire tribe of headhunters. He installed them in Coney Island. The picture below that, you see them sitting around their fire, but you see, and you see people who had come in to view the tribe of headhunters. Of course, it was highly sensationalized where they would have a scene where the headhunters would be there eating um, meat or barbecuing something. And uh, they claimed that they were eating another human being, that they were cannibal. Famous book by Claire, another book by Claire Prentice, one of the great historians of Coney Island, The Lost Tribe of Coney Island, Headhunters, Luna Park, and the man who pulled off the spectacle of the century. So Coney Island continued to become more and more exotic, more and more crazy as it moved into the more modern era of the 40s and the 50s. Well, Coney Island's decline was gradual. You could still take the subway and go out there. There was always something interesting happening, but gradually, Coney Island lost its uh, fame and it started to decline. Several factors were involved. For example, on the right, we see Robert Moses and the fall of New York. Robert Moses was the man who believed that the future of the world, and especially the United States, was in the automobile. He's the one that invented what they call the parkway, the highway, where you could jump in your car in Manhattan and you could drive to Jones Beach. One of the great creations of Robert Moses. You could drive to Long Island any place you wanted. You could drive to upstate New York and go to one of the many parks and uh, uh, recreation areas which he built. You could drive to New Jersey. So with the rise of the automobile around World War II and especially after World War II, Coney Island's decline accelerated. You had bigger and more wonderful um, parks in New Jersey, upstate New York, all over Long Island. The beaches were cleaner, the beaches were nicer, and Coney Island continued its decline. Another factor which caused Coney Island to decline was the beginning of cheap air travel. It was now possible to buy a ticket for young people to take an airline, like Icelandic Air, and cross the Atlantic and go to Europe. During the winter, people could fly to Florida, later on Cancun, Acapulco, and the beaches were beautiful. The beaches were clean. 
There was not all of the dirt and the entertainment areas. And Coney Island was being left behind as it continued its decline. Big airports, JFK, LaGuardia, Newark, New Jersey, made it very possible to, for a very reasonable price, fly off to someplace warm in the winter, someplace fun in the summer. Well, as Coney Island began its decline, it entered into the American history and especially New York history as a once wonderful place. Famous movie, Coney Island by Betty Gary Grable, George Montgomery and Cesar Romero, showing once again how exciting Coney Island once was. The Drifters, music group, which I remember from my youth, uh, their very famous song, Under the Boardwalk of the 1960s. Here again, saying that Coney Island was exciting. Once I gave this talk to a group of senior citizens on Long Island, and uh, one woman admitted that her first child was conceived under the boardwalk. So here again, and another fascinating chapter of Coney Island. The Coney Island Museum was established in 1980, and you see the building on the left. They are collecting tons of information, like the steeplechase horse, like tickets, old postcards. Uh, whenever I go to junk sales and yard sales and find something interesting, very often I'll take it out to the Coney Island Museum where if they need it, they put it on exhibit or they save it. They are constantly looking for new um, information, new artifacts to preserve this wonderful chapter in New York City history. Loads of books are being written about Coney Island. Um, they have History Day in August, where everybody brings stories and memories of Coney Island. Rick Burns' film on Coney Island. A uh, famous book, Coney Island of the Mind by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Again, showing that Coney Island was more than an amusement park. It meant an escape from the slums for millions of young Americans. It was their escape to another world. Lost amusement parks of New York City. Once again, Barbara and Wesley Gottlock celebrating and analyzing the importance of amusement parks in American history. Coney Island Lost and Found by Charles Denson. Once again, uh, remembering those amusement areas that are no longer there. Haunting Coney Island, a picture book, chronicling the decline of Coney Island. Well, here again, closing of entertainment areas, burnings, floods, hurricanes definitely are ravaging Coney Island. But some people still retain memories of Coney Island. This is Stephen Wilkes' Coney Island from 2011. Here again, you see the beach. You see all the people on the boardwalk. You see the colors, the electricity. But in the distance, you see what is gradually encroaching on Coney Island, efforts to build huge apartment blocks, public housing, a huge Russian immigrant community on Coney Island. So it is in transformation. Who knows what the future 
of Coney Island is going to be like. But it's still there. And there's me again with the Wonder Wheel in the background, uh, showing some of the um, efforts to preserve it. Some of the places have closed, but it is still definitely part of New York history, a wonderful place just to walk around on a day to say, well, I was at Coney Island and had to take a selfie of yourself. Well, what about the future of Coney Island? Who knows? Various conferences have been held on whether to uh, turn it into a giant housing complex to bring more population there, as you can see one of the plans, or it had a glorious past, but what about the future? How much can be preserved? Or should it be just dynamited and a couple of places left and attached to new hotels or restaurants? And this is a major area, major problem for all modern cities, New York City, historic preservation. How much of Harlem as an African-American neighborhood should be preserved? Well, walk up and down 125th Street and you will see that entire chapters of New York history are being destroyed. The once great Jewish Lower East Side is gone. What about the Chinatowns that are growing up now and replacing the Lower East Side with a new Chinatown neighborhood? Well, the future is a big question. In 2000, they decided to organize a Coney Island Film Festival. Once again, stressing the exotic, the crazy, the escapist. So you have alien spaceships showing up. You have the Siren Music Festival of Coney Island. You have Coney Island Rockability Festival, rock music. You have Busker Festival, circus, comedy, magic, music, juggling, acrobatics, and more. You have the famous Coney Island Music Festival in August where groups come out and perform. Once again, an effort to recreate Coney Island, not just as entertainments, but as a safe place for craziness, whether it is aliens, whether it is music festivals, all kinds of crazy things can happen. One of the more popular festivals is the Mermaid Parade. One of the few parades in New York City where you can walk naked through the streets. The only other festival where you can walk naked up and down Fifth Avenue is during Gay Pride. Well, some of the mermaids, the ones in the upper right are, are rather uh, interesting, but it is a time in the lower bottom for mermaids uh, of various sizes uh, to display their um, um, their gifts. Um, there is the Coney Island Night of the Coney Island Dead, another festival where people dress up in exotic costumes and, and uh, vampires and all kinds of living dead uh, parade through the streets. Once again, an effort to reinvent Coney Island, but keeping with the theme, the exotic strange escape from reality. Well, Coney Island is definitely a place in history. Well, I went to Waldemere in Erie, Pennsylvania when I was in college, which was another amusement park on the ocean. Today we have Disneyland's around the world. 
Six Flags Great Adventure, Disneyland Paris 2021. So amusement parks, escape areas are still part of our society. We need them. We enjoy them. And they are part of the human need to escape from reality. And as I'm speaking now, this is at the high point of the COVID-19 pandemic. And more than ever, people need to escape from lockdowns and masks and vaccinations. And what better place to escape is to go and just stroll through Coney Island wearing a mask, but yet escaping from reality. So if you have something you'd like to share with me, uh, this is my Gmail address, ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. Love to hear people um, uh, make comments on my many um, uh, YouTube videos and Zoom videos. So feel free to contact me. So it has been a wonderful um, um, visit. I hope to see you sometime in the future for another exciting um, discovery of another chapter of New York, American, or world history. So this is Dr. Ronald Brown logging off. I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I hope to see you sometime in the future. So thank you very much, and bye-bye.